Hi, this is Pastor Tim Bagwell. I'm so glad that you're watching. I've got such an incredible word to share with you today. I believe it's going to impact your mind, your spirit, your body, your finances, because there's something about the word. The word will make you free. I know that God cares about you and he cares about your family. He wants to touch your loved ones that are lost. He wants to heal the family member that's sick. He wants to help you be the person that God has called you and ordained you to be. I know that what you're getting ready to hear is going to liberate you, encourage you, and give you strength to face the battles that you're about to face in the future. Well, remember this, we care about you, we're praying for you, for your family, and most of all, remember, you are who God says you are. 1 Kings, the 18th chapter and the 41st verse. 1 Kings, the 18th chapter and the 41st verse. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, and he put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. So he told him on seven occasions. So he made one trip, came back. There's nothing. Another trip. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up and say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heavens was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. God anointed every ear to hear, every mind to perceive and every heart to believe in Jesus' name. And everyone said, you may be seated. Everybody say one more time. When Pastor Ronnie Harrison was here, uh, there were some powerful things that he shared with this house. Many of you were here, many of you weren't here. But the truth of the matter is, there was that underlying thought process of persistence, of understanding we are in a season that we've got to continue to press for what we know God has promised us. And in this account, I think it's such a powerful account because fire has just fallen from heaven. There has been a purging in the nation of Israel. There has been a repentance, and God is preparing to bring financial restoration, spiritual restoration, and he's getting ready to overthrow the pagan culture that had taken control of the nation of Israel. Really never in the history of Israel had there been such a cultural negative revolution. Never in the history of Israel had so many people backslidden and turned their backs on Jehovah to actually go into temples and worship idols and false gods. Jezebel was the responsible party for initiating it, but Ahab was a partner in crime because he knew the truth of the reality of the God of Israel and would do nothing to defend the God of Israel. So now the prophet arises, fire falls, the prophets of Baal are slain, and God begins to activate a season of restoration. I want you to understand one thing. God's heart is to bless you. Uh, I'm going to say that again because that's a good time to say amen. I said God's heart is to bless you. And sometimes you think you're permanently disqualified because maybe you've made wrong decisions, bad choices, committed sins, done things that were diametrically opposed to the Word of God. But I want you to hear me today. God's heart is is to bless you. It will require a turning. It will require a change in direction. God spoke to the nation of Israel in the book of Joel, and he basically said to them, I will restore the years 
that the caterpillar, the canker worm, the palmer worm have devoured that great army that I sent among you. God sent that judgment. But then when Israel repented, God reversed it and said, I will restore the years. Some of you are one prayer away from a reversal. No, nobody heard me. I said, some of you are one prayer away from a reversal. And you keep living beneath your privilege or you keep struggling financially or you keep struggling emotionally or spiritually. And sometimes you are trying to get God to agree with the actions you are living when God's saying, I'm not changing my word, but if you will change your position, I will bless you like you have never been blessed before. And so here Israel is as backslidden as they probably ever been in their history, but yet when they fell on their knees on Mount Carmel and said, the Lord, he is God, God began the process of reversing the curse and activating revelation. Now, uh, the prophet said, I hear a sound of abundance of rain. Well, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. There was no lightning. There was no thunder. So what did he hear? Well, what he heard was 1 Kings 18, verse 1. And 1 Kings 18, verse 1 says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go and show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. The word or the sound of the rain did not come from lightning or thunder or the skies blackening. The sound of the rain came from the voice of God himself. And there are things that God has spoken to every one of your spirits that if you will hear them and believe them, when Jerry Savell was here, he said, it's not just saying I receive it, but I believe it and I receive it. If you believe what God is saying, then you will receive what God is talking about. And so he heard a sound of an abundance of rain when God said that I will send rain upon the earth. So now that the repentance has happened, the altar of the Lord had been restored, the fire had fallen, the miracles of a nationwide revival were in motion. Now he tells his servant, go to the mountain and come back and tell me what you see. So he made his first trip. So he climbs. They're, they're down there at base camp, wherever that was at. And he says, go to the mountaintop. So he climbs all the way up the mountain. And he looks and he says, there's nothing going on. Climbs all the way back down. And prophet says, what did you see? He said, nothing. Go up again. So he goes up again. And he looks, and he says, well, same as it was, comes back down. Well, what did you see? Nothing. We'll go up again. See, there comes a point when you believe what God says so much that you won't accept no for an answer. There comes a point when you know that you know that you've heard from God so in depth that you won't accept nothing as an answer, that you will not accept clear skies and sunshine when you know you heard God said rain. So he goes up again. He makes his third trip. He looks around. The sun is shining. It's 100 degrees. There's not even a breeze in the air. There's not anything. He comes back down. And the prophet says, what would you see? Nothing. Go up again. Oh, my Lord. I don't let this man is out of his mind. He has sunstroke. He goes up the fourth time, and he looks. He sees nothing. So he's got to climb all the way back down. And, and now coming down is just as hard as going up sometimes. Comes back down the fourth time. And he said, what'd you see? Nothing. You know, could I take a break? No, go back up. He goes back up the fifth time. He looks and he says, well, I think I... I, I gotta have to go down and tell him again that it's nothing. And he comes down and says, What'd you see? Nothing. Now, I don't know about you, 
But we live and we ask, and we believe when we ask, we should have an answer. Well, if my faith is where it ought to be, then I'd get an answer on the first, uh, the first ask. Well, I don't think any of you can say where you're at is any greater than where Elijah was at. The man just called down fire from heaven. The man just created a cultural, spiritual revolution within a matter of minutes. The man had caused a widow to have her oil and meal multiplied. Are you following me? This was no minor leaguer. No, this is no a single A baseball guy hoping he can hold on and maybe someday uh, play a couple years. No, this guy's major league. He's not just major league, he's all star. He's not just all star, he's MVP. He's not just MVP, he is the MVP of all prophets. You say, how could you be so sure? Because he's the one that showed up on the mountain of transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured. It was Moses and it was Elijah. So we've got the MVP. So now we've got the MVP prophet of all time and the guy has made five trips and come back and said nothing and he knows that he knows what he heard from God and his response is, go up again. So the sixth trip is made, and he goes up again, and it's hotter than it was because now it's later in the day. The sun's shining hotter. Sweat's pouring down his face. He's wondering, what on earth? Oh, God, i got to go back down again, and i got to tell him nothing, and he's dreading to go down again. He's going to be heartbroken to think that I've got to go say, after he says, what would you see? And then I say, nothing. And I know what you're going to say. Because you are so convinced you've heard from God. You are so convinced that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know that God told you there was going to be a sound of an abundance of rain. I know, I know, go up again. So he climbs up again and he looks up in the sky and he sees, oh, thank God, it's not much. But I see a little cloud, not a big cloud. Realize in the Holy Writ it said little cloud, not big cloud. A little cloud that looked like a man's hand. Well, at least I don't have to say nothing. And it goes back down. And he said, what would you see? He said, I see a little cloud like a man's hand. That's all the prophet needed. He said, now, go tell Ahab. You better get yourself ready. It's getting ready to rain. The servant's thinking, this man has lost his mind. There's no rain in that cloud. But see, when you hear a voice that has power over all things, you can take a little something and by faith, faith see God bring to pass what he said but but I gotta you say well oh that servant that servant he was such a man of tenacity because he climbed up that mountain seven times no the prophet was the man of tenacity because he's looking at the servant said just do what I tell you to do climb up again and then he said climb up again and then he said climb up again because he was convinced I don't know if God would have made him go 12 or 15 times he may have had a dead servant but the thing basically was on the seventh trip he saw something and some of you are right on the verge excuse me of one more time you're gonna climb your mountain and instead of saying oh God I see nothing you're gonna say I don't see a lot but I see enough to know that God is beginning to make a way where there seems to be no way can somebody say one more time no, 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 I didn't hear. I said, can you say one more time? No, I think I'm going to preach over here. Can you say one more time? Sometimes it just takes one more trip. Sometimes it takes, God, I know what you said. I know what you promised, and I will 
not relinquish it. I'll say it again one more time. Galatians 6, 9 says this, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now that's the old King James. The more contemporary translations, basically the last line it says, If we don't give up. The word faint there just basically says, If we don't give up. There is an appointed time for your harvest. And you are going to reap your harvest. So don't be weary. You'll understand something when you read about great athletes or distance runners or men that push their bodies and women that push their bodies past what the, you know, would be normal. Marathon runners especially. And what they have found out that many times it does not have anything to do with what the capacity of the person's physical body is. It's whether they mentally give up. We give up mentally before we do physically. Are you with me? Athletes will give up mentally before they will give up physically. Their body still has a little bit more. They'd still have another wind or a second wind. There's still a way for them to press through the barrier, but the barrier is more mental than it is physical. Are you with me? So what's happening? He said, don't be weary in well-doing. Now you've got to push past the barrier. You've got, you're doing good and you are not being reciprocated for the good. All of a sudden, it got quiet. No, hear me. You are doing good, and you are doing what God is telling you to do. You know, it, it said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost with power, who went about doing good and healing all the sick and delivering the bound because God was with him. But here's the key. He went about doing good. How many of you have done good, you've sown good seed, but you haven't seen any harvest? About two of you. I said, how many have sown seed, but haven't seen the harvest? I, 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 I have sown, and my wife and I have sown seed, not just financial seed, but seeds of kindness, seeds of compassion, seeds of loving people, seeds of uh, kind of embracing people, and nothing comes back. In fact, some of them, you're, the more kind you are to them, the more viciously they turn on you at different times. And you say, you get weary with that because you kind of figure like if I'm nice to somebody, the least they ought to be is nice back. How many of you have ever been nice and didn't get nice? I'm not talking about super nice. I'm just talking about regular nice. Maybe even less nice than you were to them, but you got some nice back. How many have ever been nice and didn't get nothing back? How many have given things to people and hardly got a thank you? They pass you by in the hallway and say, oh, yeah, I got that. It's like they, you owed it to them. You send them a card in the mail and say, congratulations, you, you do something. And, and uh, six, five years later, they say, hey, thanks. And so you do nice and you do kind and you do forgiveness and you do compassion. And, and, and you're not getting it back. But he says here, don't be weary in that. In other words, you've got to press through the barrier. You've got to say, I've got another mile in me. I've got a second wind. What I've done unto the least of these, I've done it unto the Lord. Every card I've written, every finance I have given, every prayer I have prayed, every hour I have spent with somebody in need, I'm not going to be weary in the well-doing. What I'm going to do is I know there is a harvest at an appointed time if I don't give up. Sometimes you just got to say one more time. Oh, I've quit the ministry at least once a week for the last 40 something years. I, I didn't actually do it, but mentally I did. Yeah, because you get wearied with it. Oh, pastor, we love you so much. 
Oh, pastor, your ministry has transformed our life. Oh, pastor, we wouldn't be who we are in God today. Oh, pastor, thank you so much for all the hours you've spent in prayer and all the sermons you preached and all the times you laid hands on me and all the prophecies I've seen come past. But I think we're going to go over here to church now and pay our tithe over there. Well, you know, the Lord has specific leadings for people. I know he does, but don't tell me it doesn't bug me. You know, when I stand at the coffin with you and when I stand at the deathbed with you, are you following me? When I hear your moans and groans and you catch me in the hallway and it's not, oh, God has been so good to me. It's, oh, Pastor, pray. And you pray and then now you're going to go over here after 20 years. Weary. Now, Pastor Gala deals with it real well. She's more saved than I am. You get weary in it. But see, I know something. I got a harvest if I don't give up. No, 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 no. You, you got to hear me. I got a harvest if I don't give up. See, Chris, I'm going to reap if I don't give up. And so when I have to one more time say, okay, tell me your story. When I have to one more time say, all right, hasta la vista, chao, bon noche. I know, go, go help them over there. If I, if I got a one more time, I'm going to go one more time, and there's going to be some one more times in all of our life, and we're going to look up and we're going to see something that we haven't seen before. We're going to see miracles uh, that we haven't seen before. We're going to see an outpouring that we haven't seen before. We're going to see healings that we haven't seen before. We're going to see a multiplying 30, 60, 100 fold that we haven't seen before. For. And the prophet said, I don't care that you've been up there six times and saw nothing. You're going to see something at some point. Just don't give up. Everybody say, don't give up. Don't give up. Man, you run the race and you can see the finish line. But don't give up. Don't give up when the miracle's in view. It was just a cloud the size of a man's hand. And the prophet's up. Man, he's, he'd been down with his head between his knees. What'd you see? Nothing. And he said, well, I saw a little cloud like a man's hand. What'd you see? A little cloud. Not a big cloud. Now, let's get this in perspective. Oh, you saw what? I saw a little cloud like a man's hand. I said, go tell Ahab. I just, all I need with just one tiny piece of evidence to move to the next level. Stay with me. He wouldn't give up. He wouldn't give up. I may have to kill this servant, but he's going to keep going up there till he sees something. Go to Luke, the fifth chapter. Everybody okay? Luke, the fifth chapter, the fourth verse. And it said, now when he had left speaking... He said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Now, he just borrowed the fisherman's boat to preach on because the crowd was so big. So he stood in the boat and he preached. And now he's done preaching. He tells Peter, okay, let's go out into the deep. And, and Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the drought of fishes which they had taken. For he was, a, uh, the which were taken. Next verse. There we go. And so was also James and John and the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Now, we toiled all night and caught nothing. Everybody say nothing. Well, what'd you see? Nothing. What'd you catch? Nothing. What'd you see? Nothing. What'd you catch? Nothing. Fine. Throw your net 
on the other side of the boat. Now let's think about this. You're out in the ocean. And, there's, and so this is one side of the boat. So you've been throwing your net over here. So let's just say the other side of the boat is here. Now that's not that much distance. This is not like steer the boat and go seven miles north and then two miles west and then throw, no, uh, just do this, just do this. I know you toiled all night and this is right where you were toiling and you've been throwing your net right here. So drag your net over here and throw it now. Well, we caught nothing over there. And now we are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now we're 20 feet, maybe, if it was that much, over here. And you, he's thinking, he's a fisherman. You think there are no fish over there, but 20 feet to the right, there are fish. Nevertheless, nevertheless, more or less, what do I got to lose? At your word, I'm going to throw this net. I'm so tired, I can hardly lift it. I have been disappointed. I threw it and pulled it back in. Threw it and pulled it back in. Threw it and pulled it back in. Didn't even get a guppy. <laughs> threw it and pulled it back in. Had what? What did he have? I've climbed up the mountain five times, and every time I came back and said, what was up there? What did he say? <laughs> but I'm going to climb up one more time, and I'm going to one more time throw my net on the other side of the boat. And when he did, all those fish happened to be 20 feet away. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. They estimated by the time they brought in this catch and it nearly sank two ships, it was more than a year's income. They caught enough fish to sustain their business for a year in a one more time. Nothing. Nothing. I'm going to do this one more time. I'm tired. Listen to a long sermon. I let you use my boat. Now you think you're a fisherman? Fine. But nevertheless, one more time. And bam! The net, I can't even pull it in. Help me. Guys, the net's breaking. The boat's sinking. Get over here. And they come over. And now they just keep pulling fish in, pulling fish in, pulling them in, pulling them in. One more time. Just about time you're ready to fold up your nets. Just about the time you're ready to say, I don't care what you say. I'm not going up that mountain one more time. I don't care what, what you think. I have climbed that asked it, gone to the same spot, looked in the same direction, and I've come back with a nothing. I came back with nothing, nothing, nothing. God said, try me one more time. Try me one more time. Then Jesus, this fish thing's kind of interesting. Go to John 21. Everybody okay? Hey, John 21 and uh, verse 5. Jesus saith unto them, children, have you any meat? And they said, answered him and said, no. So they'd been out fishing, and what had they caught? Okay, now, remember the part of the sermon where I said he climbed up the mountain and he said what? Nothing. You remember, they threw the net over and they caught nothing. So he asked them if they got any meat. So what was their response? No. Nothing. You say, well, that's not in this. No, it's in the Bagwell translation. He said, do you have any meat? We got nothing. We're pulling up a big zero. So, and Jesus said unto them, and he said unto them, cast the net on the right side. He said, here we go again. We got this. Well, there must be fish 15 feet away now. 
So now cast the net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. And they cast therefore and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fishes. What God was, was it that the, the fish weren't 15 feet away? No, it was the fact that sometimes God puts us in a position when we have become so weary in well doing and he's saying, are you going to give up or not? Are you going to quit? Are you going to stop? Are you going to, you got a hundred yards to go to your miracle. Are, are you going to say, I don't have any more strength? Are you going to be so weary in well-doing that you're going to miss your harvest because you give up? Why don't you throw the net on the other side of the boat? Because it doesn't have anything to do with 15 or 20 feet. It has to do with what I'm telling you to do. And if I tell you to climb the mountain, then climb the mountain. And if you keep climbing the mountain and you keep knocking and you keep asking and you keep seeking, eventually the door's going to open. The answer's going to come and you're going to find what you're looking for. Some of you are one tap on the door away from what you've been looking for. Some of you are one more time away from asking and to receiving. Is it okay if I share this, Nolan? Nolan came up to me the other day and he said, Pastor, I, 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 I'm, they just got relocated back into the Castle Rock area from way, way up north, which was hindering them from being a part of our services and a part of our worship, and they got relocated located in his business back down into Castle Rock. Well, then all sorts of stuff started happening, and he wasn't sure if he was going to lose his position because of all this corporate issue. And he came to me and said, we got to pray. And I said, let's pray. Let's believe God. So he comes up to me uh, grinning like he's a, the cat that caught the canary. And he said, I got to tell you something, Pastor. Thank God for that hallway moment. He said, I got to tell you something, Pastor. He said, I got news and I got the job and the position I needed. I said, oh, praise God, so you don't have to move from Castle Rock. No, I don't have to move, but I also got a $13,000 a year increase. See, there's a one more time that we got to start looking at. There's a moment in time that we got to start looking at some things uh, and saying it's not about the 15 feet. Uh, it's not about the trip up the hill. It's about doing what he told me to do, and if I won't give up, I will will reap my harvest. I'll give God a shout. I think somebody, for about the next 10 seconds, uh, I think you ought to give God the kind of praise uh, that a one more time God is worth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I'm further along than you think I am. First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Rejoice evermore, which means rejoice all the time. Next verse. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. You know, those are little one-liners that are pretty powerful. Let's go to the top of them again. First one. Rejoice all the time. Rejoice all the time. So you're rejoicing when you're pulling up empty nets. You're rejoicing when you climb up the mountain and see nothing. You're rejoicing when it's like things are diametrically opposed to the prophecies that God has given you. But you keep rejoicing. Next verse, it says, pray without ceasing. So Pastor Ronnie illustrated this so well. He said, you just got to ask, seek, and knock and repeat. Ask, seek, and knock, repeat. Oh, yeah, well, that's a lack of faith. No, he said, pray without ceasing. So, how do you keep praying without ceasing if you're not praying about things that you've already prayed about? Now, think about this. Now, come on, when you pray, don't you have some things you're really praying about? Don't you have somebody you're really praying for? So you ask and you seek and you knock and then you say nothing. So what do you do? You, do you give up or do you go back up the mountain again and say, I'm asking, I'm seeking, 
and I'm knocking. Yeah, but I've just pulled in the net and there was nothing. Oh, well, what do you do? I'm asking, I'm seeking, and I'm knocking. What is that? That's praying without ceasing. You say, oh, my Lord, I've been praying for this child for a year. I've been asking for their salvation, seeking signs that they're repenting, uh, knocking on the door of their heart with prayer and intercession, and I'm seeing nothing. What do you do? Repeat. You go up the mountain again. You throw the net on the other side of the boat. And somewhere, somewhere you're going to reap at the perfect moment if you don't give up. Word of life, I'm here to tell you something. We're going to reap corporately if we don't give up. We're going to reap individually if we don't give up. Do you think it's easy to persevere? It's not any easier for me than it is for you. But part of the fruit of the Spirit is perseverance. It is endurance. So I ask and I seek and I knock. And if I ask again, it doesn't mean I don't believe. It just means I'm going to keep asking, I'm going to keep seeking, and I'm going to keep knocking because I know somehow, some way, it's going to rain. Oh, give him a shout. That's a shout moment. I said give him a shout because the victory is yours and the battle is the Lord's. No, 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 no. So go to Acts. Acts. 12th chapter, 5th verse. It says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So they're having this extenuated prayer meeting. So, so what they all do, come together, you know, bring in some chicken nuggets from Chick-fil-A and all the different sauces and some of those waffle fries and some lemonade and, you know, and so, all right, we're all here together now to have some food and some fellowship and we're going to pray for Peter to be delivered. Father God, in the name of Jesus, let's all join hands, get in the spirit of agreement right now. Oh, Father, we got to join hands, uh, get in the spirit of agreement. Uh, uh, we got to join hands. Come on, help me now. We're all, we, we, we're joining hands, and we're getting, come on, help me now. You, you, you rise, and you might as well help too. You down here on the second row. Oh, we all in the spirit of agreement. Oh, God, oh, our dear brother Peter, Peter, Lord God, all he's done is serve you. He's preached the undefiled gospel, and he's been falsely accused and falsely taken into captivity. And we declare in the name of Jesus that you will deliver him from this foul, unjustified attack against his call in ministry. And we seal it done in faith believing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's eat. No, it said they prayed without ceasing. So what did they keep praying about? God, Peter is in prison. We are believing you to deliver him. Peter is in prison. And God, somehow, some way, we don't know what it's going to take. But God, you can make a way where there seems to be no way. Hour one goes by. And what happens? Nothing. Second hour goes by. What happens? Nothing. Third hour goes by. What happens? Nothing. But it said they prayed without ceasing. They prayed without ceasing. They prayed without ceasing. And God sends an angel. And the story is fascinating. Don't have time to get into all of that. Sends an angel, liberates him, sets him free. He goes to the house. Mm, Shandai, where they were praying without ceasing. Uh, and he knocks on the door. And a little girl goes to the door and says, oh, my God, it's Peter. And she runs back in and says, it's Peter. He's at the door. You crazy. Peter isn't at the door. Peter's in prison. You know, sometimes we pray without ceasing. And when God answers, we're saying, oh, no, there's still nothing. Uh, oh, no, uh, there's no fish in the net. And God's saying, uh, 
if you can get to a place that in everything you give thanks and you pray without ceasing it may not be the first trip up the mountain but you're going to make the one more time prayer one more minute one more hour one more trip one more seed one more prayer and God starts answering Stay with me. I'm about to bless myself. Second Kings 5.14. Now, all these are incredible accounts. I mean, anybody that can preach can preach about Peter being prayed out of prison. And anybody can preach can preach about Naaman being healed. But I, I just got a point I got to bring out here. Second Kings 5.14. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan. Now, it's kind of getting to the bottom line. The king sends a letter to the king of Israel and basically has knowledge that people have been healed in Israel. And he wants the king to help Naaman who is dying of leprosy. The king panics. The prophet says, send him to me. I'll take care of him. So the prophet doesn't even come out. This big, important political leader, big five-star general, captain of the host, so important that the king is writing letters to other kings. The prophet doesn't come out. He sends out Gehazi. Gehazi, tell him go dip seven times in the Jordan. God will heal him. Oh, Naaman just is upset. I mean, he's not invited in for tea. He doesn't get a crumpet. He doesn't uh, get to sit down at the prophet's table. He doesn't get any special treatment. He just gets an order. Go dip seven times in joy. And then he starts citing off the names of the rivers in his country and how crystal clear and beautiful they are. Why can't I go dip there? The Jordan's a dirty, muddy river, and I have a skin disease. And his servant says, basically, what do you got to lose? You're dying. What if he's right? So he convinces Naaman. But stop and think about this. You, your flesh is infected and being eaten up with leprosy. And you're climbing into a polluted, dirty river. And he just didn't say dip in the Jordan. He said dip seven times. You know, sometimes God doesn't give us things on the first answer. So he dips, comes up. I'm sure he's checking his skin. Nothing. Dips again, comes up, looks. What does he see? Thank you for three people. Dips the third time, comes up. What does he see? Oh, praise God, the resurrection has occurred. Dips the fourth time, comes up. What does he see? Dips the fifth time, comes up. What does he see? Dips the sixth time. What does he see? Now, wouldn't you be getting a little discouraged even though the man of God said seven times, seven times, seven times, seven times. But still, you've looked at your skin on the first dip. Nothing. It's, I, maybe he was thinking about a progressive healing. You know, maybe I, I, it's getting a little better. It's not completely. It's getting a little better. But I see, oh, Lord, it, nothing. And Three, it's, uh, what, you'd think that after three dips, at least something might be scabbing over or, or there might be some sign, nothing. In fact, I think it's getting worse because it's so dirty and it looks like everything's getting infected. Uh, uh, the sixth time, oh my God, there's nothing. So if I dip one more time and he thinks there's going to be a change, but sometimes you just get right to that end of the rope. And you say, why not? Have you just ever been to that place of saying, why not? Why not throw the net on the other side? Nevertheless, why not climb up the hill one more time? Why not dip one more time? And when he comes up, it's all done. In a matter of the snap of a finger, 
the one more time transformed his life. Some of you are one trip away, one prayer away, one dip away, one yard away if you just won't quit. Because right now God's saying, I got a miracle waiting on you. I've got a rain cloud waiting on you. I just need you to go one more time. Next Sunday is Pentecost. And we all rejoice. How many know that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing and a mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a mass to fire. And it sat upon each of them. And behold, they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. And we read about how Peter marched out. The man that had denied the Lord marched out and said, We are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel that in the last days I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters they shall prophesy and your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions and upon my servants and upon my handmaidens I will pour out of my spirit and they shall prophesy and we all rejoice in that and next Sunday we're going to see a supernatural outpouring and people are going to be filled with the Holy Ghost and signs and wonders and miracles are going to begin to happen but I want to ask you a question. What about those 10 days in the upper room? Go to Jerusalem and tarry until you receive power. He didn't say until the day of Pentecost. He said until you receive power. Well, we're here. What do we do now? I don't know. What are we waiting on? Power. What kind of power? I think he said something about Holy Ghost power. Yeah, but what's going to happen? I don't know. Are we going to feel anything? I don't know. Did it already come? I don't think so. What do you think going to be here? I don't know. Well, how long have we been here? About five minutes. Was well, anybody going to go out and get Chick-fil-A? Are, are, are you with me? Day one goes by. Nothing. Oh, you think God sort of eased it in there, kind of raised the temperature a little bit, you know, give them a little breeze, come to, no, nothing. Day two goes by. Nothing. Day three goes by. Nothing. Four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine. So, and I'm not saying that on an exact chronological dynamic, but we do know that, that Pentecost was 50 days. Jesus ascended basically 40 days on earth. So I figure this is a 10-day window approximately. And so they're just sitting there. Now I want to ask you a question. There were probably over 500 that heard the commandment to go to Jerusalem and tarry. But there was 120 in the upper room. Day one. Boy, when you, has anything happened? Nothing's, nothing's happened. Oh, man. Uh, you know, I, I, I got to go. I got work to do. Uh, day number two. Lord, have mercy. You know, my, my kid's got a soccer game. I got to get out of here. You know, I can't stay here all day. You know, it's a championship game. I got to get there. Day number four. Oh, I, I, my, my cell phone is, is loading up. I, I got all sorts of texts, and I got business clients. Uh, day five, and nothing's happening. Are you sure it had, hadn't happened? Are you sure we haven't received? I, 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 and by the time the day of Pentecost was fully come, there was 120 that hung in there one more day. And when they got to the one more day, there came a sound. and a wind and a fire and what they'd been waiting on
came on them and they all said this is it are you feeling it are you feeling it are you this is it my god there's something on your head there's something right here this is it my god duke i hear language coming out of you that I, this is it there's something like a fire coming out of you right now but there was 120 that hung in there one more day and i don't know about you but i feel like we're the line is being filled up with one more day people give him a shout of victory yes suddenly there came a sound the sound of a one more day suddenly there was a little cloud like a man's head suddenly the leprosy was gone it was one more trip one more day one more net being thrown overboard do i have any one more day people hallelujah I'm done preaching, but uh, there's a little widow woman. I have just enough oil and just enough meal to make me one more cake for me and my son. And the prophet said, all you got to look forward to is nothing. Dipped six times, Chris. My body is getting worse instead of better. And I hope you would have said, just dip one more time. He said seven times, and he dipped one more time. And the little woman took a little oil and a little meal and said, here, here's one cake. It's the best I can do. Here's one cake. It's all I got. Just I baked hundreds and thousands of cakes, but here's one more cake. Yeah. And God said, now, now, that cake loosed it. That trip loosed it. That trip across the boat loosed it. That dip loosed it. Just say it with me. One. Oh, you got more in you than that. One. one. More. Time. One more time. They kept asking, set Peter free. Prayed, I don't know how many hours they prayed, but I don't think it was five minutes. Oh God, they've been praying for hours. All I know is still heard nothing. Scared them to death when the answer came. Some of you are going to be terrified when the answer hits. It's going to shock you. We'll have to get CPR for you. But what happened? I had a heart attack because I got an answer. But the truth of the matter is your one more time is getting ready to activate something supernatural in your life. One more cake. One more dip. One more trip. One more hour of prayer. Jesus on the cross. And that at 11th hour, miracles begin to happen for eternity's sake. All I'm saying to you uh, is don't quit now. If you don't quit now and you don't give up, you will reap your harvest. If you believe in giving the kind of praise it is worthy of.